The longest stretch I've ever gone without food was about a week. Watching people suffer was the worst. I mean, I've seen a lot of people die, but it comes in so many different ways. His name is Mohammed Ag Albake, and he went through hell. Caught in an epic disaster, the Great African Famine of 1984. Drought struck, the grass died, then the flocks, and without milk or meat, people starved. Children like Mohammed first. Were you scared? <laughs> yeah, I was very scared. But I have this thing with fear. I'm never paralyzed with fear. How Mohammed survived when tens of thousands died is an incredible story of a unique boy toughened as an outcast in his own land. He was born to the Tuaregs, a nomad people who travel the crags and sands of the Sahara. Tuareg men need to be agile and strong. Mohammed was not. He had a clubbed foot and a hunched back and a label. Cripple. They would taunt you. And so what did that do? I guess it gave me inner strength because after a while I didn't hear it anymore. A crippled boy in a tribe of nomads has little to hope for. But when Mohammed was nine, even that hope died. Amid ethnic conflict, Nigerian soldiers grabbed the boy, trucked him hundreds of miles from his family, and dumped him in the desert near Timbuktu. That's where we ran into him while covering the horrifying famine. Speak English. OK. He was sharp enough to learn English on the streets, but he was hungry, sick, homeless. And my mother and my father, they are in Nigeria now. He'd been on his own for two years. At age 11, Mohammed's life looked bleaker than ever. I didn't speak the language. You were disabled. I was disabled. You were alone. I was alone. All I did was cry. But I got over it because I have to eat. No easy task in a town teeming with refugees, where every kernel of grain was precious. Meat so scarce it was worth a fortune even covered with flies. I was better off than a lot of, a lot of kids out there because they had no, no clue. A lot of kids had no clue. What happened to them? A lot of them died. A lot of them died. Mohammed learned to stave off the hunger pains by fooling his ravaged body. Some of the kids who smoked said, if you smoke uh, tobacco, it'll stop you from being hungry. So I tried it, and I smoked it, and God, it worked a little. <laughs> as hungry as he was, Mohammed says his devout Muslim faith prevented him from stealing. A lot of people were dying, and if I had died, and they stole, well, I knew where thieves go. Thieves go to hell. That was an immediate concern. Like so many kids around him, Mohammed felt his life ebbing away. I can remember the first day that I thought I was near death. How would an 11-year-old boy know he was about to die? My muscles, I couldn't move a muscle. I would get up, take a few steps, and fall. So I hobbled to the market, begging for food store owner gave me a loaf of bread. Your life was saved. And my life was saved for the moment. And that's when we met Mohammed. He was literally begging to stay alive. People, many people then give me two pennies, <laughs> 50 pennies. I, if they give me, I will go to buy some food. Turns out our meeting him was no accident. I remember scoping you guys out because I saw the big cameras and I said, oh. Well, definitely, if I go to these people, I'll eat for at least two days. So you stalked me. I stalked you guys. I figured I would talk to you guys for about oh, a minute or so and beg for food and go on my merry way. And fortune smiled again. Two weeks later, Mohammed spotted another TV crew from CBS. His brief interview ran in August 1985 on 60 Minutes. 
Are you hungry? Yes. All the time? Yes. In Indianapolis, Cheryl Schatz, a public relations consultant and mother of three, watched the program riveted. What I quickly saw was a child with a little half smile on his face and that irritated me and angered me very much that any child should have to accept a life like that. For three days she anguished, then decided to act. And we went to bed and as we were falling asleep I said, I wonder if that little boy has eaten today. And I just turned to my husband and I said, I know what I'm going to do. That child is my son. And I have to find my son and I have to bring him home. My husband looked at me like I had lost it. And he says, where is he? And I, Africa? He says, big continent, Cheryl, where in Africa? I said, some, some place called Mali. But back in Mali, despite the chaos, somehow a note from Cheryl got through to a missionary who knew the boy she sought. He said, Mohammed, hi. I just got a letter from these strange people in Indiana. I said, what's Indiana? I said, well, these people want to adopt you. I said, they want to what? What is that? So they said, oh, they want to make you their kid. I said, they want to make me their houseboy. I can do that. Their servant? Yeah, basically their servant. And you were OK with that? And I was, I was OK with that. Three square yeah, meals I mean, a day. Yeah, cool. I can do that. And he goes, no, I don't think you understand. He said, they want to take you to the US. I said, really? Things moved quickly. Cheryl filed to adopt, and Mohammed got his first passport. And four months after Cheryl saw him on TV, Mohammed was in his new mom's arms in Indianapolis. Did you feel welcome? Definitely. I had the biggest grin on my face the whole time. I just, I just loved it. I was getting some serious love. Oh. And some serious food. For once, Mohammed had a full belly and parents to take care of him, support for his next door deal. He was a medical mess. He had TB of the spine, scoliosis, kyphosis, malaria, cerebral malaria, polio, severely damaged clubfoot that had gone into gangrene. Young Mohammed would undergo several major operations, but like any tough Tuareg nomad, he never cried. Never. Once. In all of the surgeries, he just looked at me and he said, Mom, this is a hell of a pain. That's the most he ever complained, ever. His body healing, his diseases cured, Mohammed still fought a final battle. This bright youngster, who had taught himself to speak in six languages, came here to America unable to read in any language, much less English. All he could write was his own name. They put me in a first grade classroom. You were 13? I was 13. Bigger mm -hmm. than, gosh, twice the size, three times the size of most of the kids. So you're in little chairs? In little chairs with, with a little books. desk with coloring books and, God, it was awful. <laughs> So the street kid from Africa went back to the streets, practicing reading traffic signs, then billboards, with a thirst for learning and his never-say-die attitude. Just practice, practice, practice. <laughs> it worked. This spring, the nomad boy who survived the famine charmed his way onto TV, won the heart of a mom in America, and learned to read graduated from one of this country's most prestigious colleges, Georgetown University. Muhammad al-Baghi. The little boy Cheryl shot saved is a man. It's the real thing. And Muhammad has not turned his back on his past. He majored in African and Middle East studies. This proud American citizen hopes someday to help solve the formidable problems of the world he left behind. Now my goal is to be the highest and most powerful diplomat in, on the planet. The top American diplomat, U.S. Secretary of State. When I first arrived here, the only thing I could write was my name, Mohammed. I don't give up when something frustrates me. I just do it. 
guess I just have one of those spirits that doesn't give up. Not this one. Huh? Yeah. Not this one, huh?